Welcome to a special guest edition of Space Buds, the podcast. I'm your host, Michael Green, and today I'm very lucky to be joined by United States Senator Gary Peters, representing our great state of Michigan. Senator, thank you so much for being here and making some time for us while you visit our beautiful state of Oregon. How are you liking it so far? I love it, and I love Oregon. What an amazing uh, state. I had an opportunity earlier to get out to the coast, which was uh, spectacular, where the sun came out and sky was blue and life was good. Yeah, summer is the best time to be out here, and the yeah. unspoiled coast is amazing. Yeah, it is incredible. For those of you who may not know, Senator Peters has been an important advocate for the medical and recreational programs in his state of Michigan. And if that's not exciting enough for you, he's also one of the Senate members in charge of overseeing NASA. But before we get too excited about that and dive into everything that's been going on in space, let's keep it down here on Earth for a few moments and address some of the issues facing the cannabis industry while we have the attention of one of the few who can help to shape our future. So, Senator, let's get to it. Michigan is notorious for its historic roots in the auto industry. But as of December 1st, 2019, building on a pre-existing medical marijuana program, your state ushered in its new recreational cannabis economy. And since then, there have been over 40 recreational licenses established for retail and around 10 or so for producers and growers. What were some of the challenges you faced getting the program off the ground and how has your opinion of the industry changed, if at all, since it's been underway? Well, the, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the movement for the uh, legalization of recreational uh, cannabis uh, was, a, was a state initiative, so I wasn't directly involved as a federal official, but certainly as somebody who's been active in, in politics in the state and cares deeply about the state, have followed it uh, closely and have been involved in some federal legislation that I think we're going to be talking about here uh, shortly. But I, I'd say that uh, it was put on the ballot in 2018 and it passed uh, with a very strong uh, majority, which is kind of what we're seeing with states all across the the country when it gets on the ballot. Uh, people are embracing it, particularly if states like Michigan that had an experience with medical marijuana first and uh, the medicinal impact of that and people who have been benefiting as a result of being able to purchase uh, cannabis and use it for, for medical purposes. So, yeah, But it's had a fairly slow rollout, but, uh, but steady. Uh, part of uh, what has been, um, I would say, some of the pushback that we have received uh, on the uh, the legalization of some communities have passed ordinances that will not allow any uh, cannabis retailing uh, in communities. So it's fairly selective. In fact, a fairly large number has said that they don't want the business right now. But other communities uh, have. Uh, certainly one of those communities is Ann Arbor, which is the, the home of the University of Michigan. And uh, they, uh, when they opened up uh, to make it legal, there were long lines and, and those businesses uh, have uh, been successful. But it, it's, still, it's still a work in progress in Michigan. Uh, what do you find some of the reservations by those counties still choosing to ban these programs are? Yeah, and it's local communities. Uh, I don't, you know, there's certainly when you just think of the the history of cannabis in this country and the fact that it's been illegal for so long, and there are certainly a lot of narratives out there about it that I think people feel uncomfortable and they want to see what exactly happens before they open it up in their community. So I think that's where the, the apprehension is. And I think as we'll probably talk about later from uh, the federal perspective as well, is that you know, we're trying to change uh, what has been existing law for quite some time. Uh, and having states move forward to pass these uh, initiatives and to, to move forward is really part of our federal system of government, which is our individual states, our kind of laboratories of democracy is how you talk about it. You'll see the states will take the first actions uh, and then the federal government gets involved. The federal government, of course, and all of us in the U.S. Senate are representing all 50 states. And so you have to get a consensus among uh, over, over at least over half of the, uh, the states in order to, to move forward. So it, it's uh, it, it's a process that is actually moving uh, fairly quickly when you think about all of the number of years that we uh, prohibited it and it was illegal, but there's still a lot of apprehension out there with people and they want to wait and see. Have there been any shiny laboratories out there, for example, any other states that have helped lend some data to how you may more effectively roll out the programs uh, in the future in Michigan? Well, I think, that, you know, they have. Uh, certainly the, uh, the state legislature has been looking at other states. And, and during the campaign, a lot of folks looked at Colorado, for example, as a, you know, as a leader and, and being out front uh, in the first, uh, one of the first to, to be out there. Uh, but uh, certainly they are constantly looking for other you know, best case uh, scenarios of role models. Uh, role models, or rather, you know, what are the role models for folks? Right. Um, okay, Senator. So we've all been living with the COVID 19's impact on the economy, and millions have felt the effect of skyrocketing unemployment rates. And with all the uncertainty in the past month surrounding the virus, 
One silver lining for the cannabis industry, if you can say that, has been that cannabis in some states was and still is being deemed an essential service or product, and dispensaries have been allowed to remain open during the pandemic for the most part. What were your feelings toward these nationwide decisions initially, and how are the programs in your state affected, if at all? Well, they, they were in Michigan, they were also deemed uh, essential, and so the uh, cannabis uh, dispensaries uh, continued to be open. Clearly, they provided medical uh, cannabis, so folks needed uh, to receive uh, the uh, cannabis for those uh, purposes, uh, but it continued to be essential. Uh, yeah, and when you think of the wide range of, of establishments, anything from grocery stores and to pharmacies uh, were open, so related to the pharmacies with medical uh, marijuana, but you also had liquor stores uh, that were, were open, and certainly... Uh, I suppose there are some benefits uh, for alcohol, but uh, <laughs> right, depending on who you uh, ask, but <laughs> depending uh, what you're doing. But so, uh, uh, and, so it's along uh, kind of those lines, right? And you know, many have speculated for a lot of the different reasons why something like cannabis, which remains illegal at the federal level and is still classified as a Schedule One drug, would qualify for an essential status. And I'm sure, as you've probably verified firsthand, like you just said, through the medical marijuana marijuana programs in Michigan, it has become clear that for many, cannabis has become the essential medicine they've become to rely on day to day. And they cite this as the main reason for the essential status, like you just said. Others have actually reasoned or even joked that the anti-anxiety effects found in cannabis products alone is probably worth the essential status, considering the current state of affairs throughout the country right now. But it's also no secret that the in-state tax revenue generated by cannabis sales during this time may prove to be a great resource of revenue to help states with their economic relief efforts. So, Senator, what do you think the leading contributing factor has been to explain or earn cannabis its newly found essential status? Do you think it is in line with the fact that many people have found this as a great relief in the form of medicine or that it could be a large uh, revenue generator for the states themselves? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't part of uh, that decision. That was a state decision as to what to deem essential uh, and not. But I think you know, both, both of the, the uh, items that you mentioned uh, would have played into that uh, decision. Certainly the medical aspects is very straightforward. But there's no question states are facing significant challenges as a result of COVID-19, the, the drop in revenue. In, in Michigan, for example, we have an unemployment rate now of, of 21%, or at least those folks who have applied for unemployment insurance. So mm -hmm. when you're at 21%, you're at levels uh, similar to the Great Depression. Uh, right. And so the uh, revenues have dropped dramatically uh, for the for the state of Michigan, uh, which is why we're trying to address this, and we have to address this at the federal level, is to provide resources to state and local government so that they can continue to provide their essential services and first responders and all of the services that they provide. And, and many uh, states, like Michigan, uh, has to maintain a balanced budget so they can't go into deficit. So if they have a massive uh, uh, decrease in revenue, then they have to have really draconian cuts across the board in order to, to deal with that. And those, those are essential services that the state may provide. So, so the state needs to figure out how to maintain uh, revenue. Uh, and uh, so I, those are decisions that were certainly, I think, were central in, uh, in how uh, they made the, the final decision as to what to open. And of course, now we're starting to open things up just as uh, it's happening here in Oregon. As I've traveled around, uh, things are opening up. We're seeing that in Michigan. Uh, we, we, everybody wants to get back to business as yeah. quickly and as safely. And yeah. that's an important one, as safely as possible. We're, we are actually seeing uh, the number of cases drop dramatically and continue to drop, which really bodes well for the business to, to yeah. start up. And, yeah, it uh, seems the sooner that we can get back on track, the more likely that there'll be more businesses that can return. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, it doesn't seem like all of them will be able to. But like you said, we have to make sure that things are safe for everybody first. Yeah. So coming back to the current unemployment woes for a second, uh, the cannabis industry has been one of the few constantly growing job sectors. And even with its vast restrictions, not only for the employees of cannabis businesses, but also for for the ancillary businesses that help to supply and support their day-to-day -day operations. Yet, cannabis remains a Schedule One drug. And for those of you who don't know, any substance classified as a Schedule One drug, by definition, is stated to have zero medical or societal benefits. And we've already highlighted why that's clearly not the case when it comes to the medical or society value of recreational or medical cannabis. So, due to the lack of reclassification, which has lingered for more than 20 years, running a legal marijuana business has been impacted in detrimental ways since these programs began. Are you familiar with Tax Code 280E, which was created just for the purpose of taxing a marijuana business handling a Schedule One plant? 
Yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know, under this tax code 280E, Canada businesses cannot make traditional deductions of business expenses outside of the cost of goods sold for that year or qualify for any credits. For example, marketing, office supplies, staffing, legal fees, accounting fees, and the list goes on and on, including any leftover inventory from that year that's not sold. This classification is also the sole reason banks are not allowed to bank or lend with cannabis companies for fear of prosecution of laundering Schedule One drug money. Senator, what do you tell the retailers in your state that, on the one hand, have been deemed essential to sell both medical and recreational cannabis, but on the other, are still treated as a criminal enterprise when filing federal taxes, to the point that many cannabis companies are left unable to profit and basically set up to fail by being taxed into the red? Well, I, I certainly, uh, we have to take a to look at that. Uh, there's no question that that has to, to be addressed. And, you know, my general sense is if, if we look at tax policy broadly, that uh, we need to have uh, equitable treatment of all businesses, that uh, the businesses need to be treated fairly. And certainly uh, when you look at a, at a day-to-day business, and I work a great deal with small businesses, to, in my mind, I, and I'm passionate about this, uh, is that small businesses are the engine of growth in our economy. That's where most of the jobs are created. That's what moves an economy going forward. And Absolutely. if we're not supporting small businesses, uh, you aren't going to have a, a robust economy. And when we think, we just talked about the, the recovery from COVID-19. If small businesses don't survive this crisis, any hope to have a quick recovery uh, pretty much disappears because you have to have those small businesses that survive. That's why I've been actively involved in the uh, uh, Paycheck Protection Program, which is available for businesses for the 7A lending uh, to provide uh, resources for them to stay. But, mm-hmm. but all to your question, uh, to your point, is that all businesses should be treated the same. If you have business expenses. Uh, that's not going to go to your bottom line. That's an expense to be able to generate revenue. And the tax code and the tax system needs to be based on uh, equitable taxation of the actual after cost uh, revenue that a business has. Right. Especially now when um, a lot of these displaced workers are going to be looking for alternative options. Well, some have proposed a safe banking act in the guise of relief for this problem to allow cannabis companies access to banks. To me, while this bill is a step in the right direction towards legitimization of the cannabis industry as a whole, this bill seems to just protect the banks from being prosecuted for working with cannabis retailers. However, the cannabis retailers and producers still remain unfairly left in the 280E tax code. And while this is great for banks, it's not so great for the cannabis industry to just have access to capital to grow their business. The more a cannabis company reinvests itself and grows sales under 280E as it stands, the more it's taxed further into the red, leaving them vulnerable by takeovers by the very same banks that are meant to help protect them. So, Senator, wouldn't simply repealing 280E, allowing cannabis retailers to run their business with the same deductions, marketing staff, rent as a regular business, make a lot more sense? Well, I think uh, that we have stages that we're going to have to go through, and that's really what the uh, the uh, Safe Banking Act represents, is that uh, every business uh, in this country can access the federal banking system and use credit cards and, and use a, a modern commercial system. Uh, we, uh, I support this uh, act. In fact, I'm a co-sponsor uh, on this act that cannabis businesses should uh, be able to operate like every other business. So, But I think that's a starting point. As we mentioned earlier in, in our discussion, is that we've got uh, laboratories of democracy, states that are opening up uh, these businesses and and moving into recreational cannabis sales. Uh, As that continues to move forward, I think the federal government won't won't lead in this issue because there's still the opposition that we talked about earlier. Uh, So uh, it's gonna follow and it's gonna follow what other states are doing. So I think really the Safe Banking Act is is an important step forward to, to recognize that and to, quite frankly, to legitimize uh, the, the cannabis business as a, as a business like every other business. I see. And here in Oregon, the recreational cannabis sales tax, uh, which can reach up to 20% in some counties, has already been utilized to help fund schools, drug rehabilitation efforts, police departments, and other social programs to help benefit the community. Coming back to 280E, legalization or even just reclassification to a Schedule Three drug uh, could make sense for both banks and cannabis businesses to be protected the same as any other legal tax bank business. If the Safe Banking Act is just a first step towards legitimizing the industry, and if this were to pass, how do you envision it playing out? And do you think it's likely in the near future that Congress uh, could repeal 280E as it pertains to the state legal marijuana programs or descheduled marijuana below a Schedule Three declassification? I, I think I think all of that is possible. I think, uh, but again, I think we need to focus on the first step and, and 
take the first step. First, we got to pass that. Right now, it hasn't passed. It's been, it's been tied up uh, in the Senate. Uh, to, to get through a Senate filibuster, you need 60 votes. So you've got to have 60 senators to vote. Uh, the way we get there uh, is to is to have more states continue to legalize within their own state, and then senators in those states are going to have a different position than if their state does not legalize it. It's a little more difficult for some of them to to vote to start moving towards legalization when their own state does not allow that. So it is, it is a process that has started in the states and needs to continue to work its way through the states. And then you'll see the federal government uh, uh, and my colleagues, uh, I think, will follow, follow the lead of our states. Have you noticed uh, that your peers or your colleagues in other states that have medical or recreational marijuana programs, that they've uh, embraced them or they've regretted implementing them? Or have, how have they reacted after the fact if some of these have been uh, implemented in their states? Have they felt ultimately that they've been surprised that they've been more beneficial and that some of the stigmas that they thought may have come along with uh, these programs are, are not there? I think that's uh, that's accurate, and and the, the states move forward are for, with popular referendums. So it's the the voters of the states that have stepped forward and said this is something that we want, and our our job is to represent the voters of our state. And if the voters of our state want something, we should uh, we should certainly uh, support that as well. Uh, and I and I think uh, part of what makes it. Uh, uh, a, uh, or what, what will we'll have this continue to go forward is the fact that other states and the voters in those other states are looking what's happening in those places that have already legalized and, and have some of the, the scary narratives that are out there, have they actually come to pass? And if they haven't, they can also look at the positive aspects of it. Uh, and part of it, which you mentioned earlier, is uh, the revenue aspects as well. And Michigan, just like here in Oregon, uses the money for a wide variety of public purposes. So it goes uh, back to, to help the taxpayers uh, generally. And, uh, that, and I think that trend will continue. All right, Senator, thank you so much. And I'm sorry to go straight into all of that, but in our line of work, it can be very hard to speak directly to those who shape the very fate of our entire industry at a federal level. And I know I can't be the only cannabis entrepreneur forever losing sleep trying to make sense of all this. So I had to take the opportunity just to touch on some of these issues. But okay, so NASA. <laughs> which many say stands for never a straight answer. So let's turn the page on the much needed cannabis tax reform now and see if we can't get some straight answers from the man who oversees NASA himself. So, Senator, uh, before we dive too deep into what may or may not be going on at NASA, can you tell us a little bit about what overseeing NASA entails and was this a position that was assigned to you or did you seek it out? Well, it's uh, first off, uh, uh, I did seek out the committee. So part of the oversight function is related to the work that I do on the Senate Committee for Commerce, Science, uh, and Transportation. So, so we, we have broad jurisdiction in, in that committee. We basically oversee all of the economy with the exception of banking um, and uh, energy, but uh, everything else. Uh, so all the high tech companies uh, in my state, for in Michigan, for example, manufacturing in the auto industry is critical, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, we oversee uh, the, the, the auto industry and manufacturing. I'm working on a National Institute of Manufacturing right now, for example, to focus our energies in this country more towards manufacturing, which is important. Who does but, oversee the banks and the uh, energy? Uh, there's a banking committee. So okay. there's a separate committee for banking, there's a separate committee uh, for energy, and then the Commerce Committee takes every everything else. But in that science fu function, uh, the science, uh, we oversee really all of the, the science uh, activities of the federal government. So think of, uh, you know, the National Science Foundation and uh, those those kinds of investments in basic research in universities, including here at the University of Oregon. I get uh, federal funding for science research that, that comes through my committee, and we uh, authorize the appropriations for it. And NASA is part of that, so NASA is there. So uh, I wanted to be on the, on the uh, full committee, which I was uh, selected to be on. And then I'm on a subcommittee that actually oversees. So each of our subcommittees kind of do a deeper dive into various industry groups or, or various other activities within the committee, and NASA is part of that. But I've always had a fascination uh, with space, as I know you have. That's yes, why yes, we're that's why we're here at Space Buds. Yeah, right. Uh, is because of your fascination, which I love. This is like a really cool place. Uh, thank uh, you so much. Uh, but it's uh, so that's why uh, uh, I certainly uh, have enjoyed it uh, a great deal. And um, I move around. There's a ranking uh, position where you're the top Democrat. On, uh, on the committee, and I was for the space subcommittee, not oh, currently, wow. but uh, but before, uh, and it's something that I uh, have always uh, followed as from a, a kid and from my generation who are inspired by the, the Apollo launch, and uh, I still remember 
vividly uh, when Neil Armstrong uh, stopped, uh, made that giant leap for mankind on the moon. And I was actually in my, my grandma's uh, home in France. My, my mother's a, a French war bride, and oh, okay. we were sitting at her little uh, table watching a little black and white TV <laughs> because the entire world was fixated uh, on that moon landing, which was... Uh, and that's just fascinating in itself, how rare that kind of a moment is even today with all the distractions. Absolutely, yeah. No, it was amazing. It was an amazing, amazing achievement. And it did. It brought the world together. We, we need more things like that to bring the world together. Absolutely. I think uh, marijuana could be one of them. However, in the meantime, um, I also understand that you're involved directly in the Emerging Threats Division of Space. Is that accurate? Well, it's a it's a different committee. So I'm on the other another committee that I'm on is the Armed Services Committee, which okay. oversees the United States military, so all aspects of it. And then I'm a ranking member on a subcommittee in that committee, which is Emerging Threats and Capabilities. So that committee, we we have two areas of responsibility. Uh, one, I oversee all of the military's special operations forces, so the Navy SEALs, the Delta Force, all those folks are in my subcommittee. And then all of the advanced research uh, for the military, the DARPA programs, which is all of the, uh, you know, kind of the black box kind of stuff that goes on in research. And so think uh, artificial intelligence and uh, hypersonic missiles and autonomous weapon systems, those kinds of things. So you get to see it all then, huh? It's an interesting place to work. And and, Uh and, and in Michigan, uh, it's actually important because we we have the research and development, a lot of, or I should say, a lot of the research and development uh, for the Department of Army because with our equities in the auto industry, the next generation combat vehicles and tanks, all of that uh, comes uh, out of Michigan. Wow. Well, what I want to talk a little bit about are some of the threats, as vast as space is, I'm sure the threats can be also just as vast. And with space-based capabilities providing integral support to military, commercial, and civilian applications, and longstanding technological and cost barriers to space falling, This enables more countries and commercial firms to participate in satellite construction, space launches, space exploration, and human spaceflight. And although these advancements are creating new opportunities, new risks for space-enabled services have emerged. Having seen the benefits of space-enabled operations firsthand, and knowing that other foreign governments are starting to develop capabilities, how do you see these threats um, to others' ability to use space? It, it, well, it is. Uh, space, uh, space debris is a, is a huge issue because we are putting so much uh, up into space. And you think about how much of our commerce uh, is related to space. Things like GPS, uh, you know, it's those satellites. When you think about our communications and more and more uh, of uh, everything is going digitally and then it's going up through satellites to be able to have instantaneous communication. So, so all of those things are, are up there. Uh, and if any of them fail, that is, has a significant implication to our daily life here. So that also creates vulnerabilities. And so we have to be concerned about the vulnerabilities if those assets are attacked. And, and quite frankly, for, for all of these years, uh, we've, we've always figured we die in the United States. So we pretty much dominate space. We put up a communication satellite up there, and no, nothing's going to happen to it. No uh, one's there to the, mess with. No it. one's there to mess with. Right, it. You right. don't have to. You don't have to put a, a fence around it. It's safe. Uh, you know, so figuratively speaking. But now we can't have that assumption. Is that we have our adversaries who understand that uh, should our should we go to war, uh, the first shots to be fired will be cyber and attacks on kind of the infrastructure that you see in space. And so you do have to harden satellites, uh, and uh, so you have to. Uh, uh, and also put up uh, additional uh, uh, systems to protect it from, from hostile action. But while we're doing all of that, I say that there's just a lot of stuff in space and eventually satellites run their, their life uh, and uh, they deteriorate. Uh, and then we have a bunch of constellations of smaller satellites, so there's just a lot of stuff up there. Mm-hmm. And it continues to orbit at, um, at the 17,000 plus miles an hour, and if it hits something, uh, it can be catastrophic. It's dangerous projectiles. It really does. So, so how do we how do we start cleaning some of that up, and or, and where do we know where it is? How do you control? We control airspace now in this country with the, the FAA. When aircraft go up in the air, we know that the planes are properly separated and they're not going to hit each other. Right. But now, imagine if we just had debris flying everywhere, and you put craft up there. How do you how do you keep the, the, that equipment safe? Now, of course, we have astronauts in space as well in the International Space Station. We want to make sure we keep them safe, uh, and they'll be like future missions. And then, so the orbit in space above, is that different? Now, when you're talking about airspace in America or other countries, you know, it's the space that's directly above us that you fly over. When it comes to an, uh, an orbit in space, how can you regulate that? What's the ch- what are the challenges in regulating 
uh, airspace in orbit so that say well a satellite or a possible advanced weaponry that's orbiting in space could be drifting over another country it is that's why we need international agreements we're, we're trying to work through exactly there are some international agreements now but how do you work through who catalogs the the debris that's there mm -hmm. who's responsible for removing particularly dangerous debris that's there uh, and it has to be done on an international basis because we have more countries also that are launching uh, launching uh, satellites in, into space. It's uh, you know, not just the, the Chinese and the Russians, and you have the European Space Agency, you have the U.S., and now you have commercial operations that we're seeing here in the United States with SpaceX and others. So uh, there are, uh, and other countries have similar kinds of operations that are happening. So you have a lot of folks uh, launching objects into space. Mm -hmm. and Nobody cleaning it up. And nobody cleaning it up. Uh, Sounds and, like uh, the ocean. Yeah, exactly, yeah, there's a lot of similarities to it. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, having a, as we were talking about, having a projectile in space moving at a high velocity is very dangerous. Have you been exploring anything promising in regards to possibly removing this junk, so like maybe a giant space net or some kind of magnetic uh, element to try and clear the, clear the air, so to speak? Uh, yes, and in fact, uh, there are uh, uh, projects to do that as to how you send up uh, other, other satellites that are basically uh, cleaning up some of that stuff and bringing it back, or figuring out how you can move it so it uh, just burns up in the atmosphere as well. So there's Very ways, well you know, some, a lot of it will, won't necessarily fall to the ground. Uh, you got to make sure it doesn't hit the ground and cause a problem so it burns up. But how do you get it out of space so it isn't up there potentially hitting another spacecraft? Right. It's just to try and track what's up there in the first place. That's a, the biggest job is, yeah, tracking it all now. And, and then once uh, there's folks that are concerned that as you have all of these objects up there, uh, once one hits one object, uh, it's kind of like a, not necessarily a dominoes, but you can see how it could... Pinball touch. kind of. Kinda, you're right. It's kind of a chain reaction of things that start... trajectories to, on every one to the next. And it's right. almost impossible. It's like whack-a-mole trying to figure then it, it all yeah, out. Yeah, then right. it becomes really tough, right? As soon as one object hits another object, its, uh, it's uh, path changes. Well, I also understand that a growing concern of NASA is how solar storms, or I guess you could say space weather in general, affects life on our planet, and how to track, prevent, or even minimize damage from these events in the future. Uh, what can you tell us about this, and should we be scared for our lives, or just maybe our way of life for a little bit, depending on the nature of these storms? Yeah, and storms happen uh, all, all the time. Solar storms uh, happen. They're basically are, are uh, uh, particles that are through mass injections uh, from uh, the sun uh, that uh, send particles out into the space at a very, very high velocity. It can be very concentrated. So, what well, basically the northern lights? When you, if you are very fortunate to look up in the sky and see the northern lights, uh, that's basically the particles from the sun mm -hmm. hitting uh, hitting the atmosphere and then burning up there. But when you get real high concentrations of that. It, it can disturb communications and uh, links and uh, navigation systems. So if you're flying in an airplanes uh, uh, or if you're using navigation systems at sea, all that can be a, a problem with these particles coming in. Where, so uh, we can deal with that, uh, but space weather is how do you track that? When do you know these storms are coming and have some forward warning? Which is really to try and predict when a uh, emission from the sun has a trajectory to actually hit our planet. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, so you have particles constantly, but you can have a real significant event. Uh, you know, those massive solar flares you see pictures of, of those massive, you know, thousands of miles up in the air and, and spewing out all of these uh, particles. Uh, that's coming at the Earth quickly. And we've had this all through history. That's, this happens when the Earth gets hit by these particles. And normally it's not a big deal. Uh, it's only a big deal if you have electric power grids and, and, and other kinds of connections because uh, when, when those particles uh, hit the Earth, uh, we, we're protected by the magnetic field, mm -hmm. which is created with the, the iron core and the Earth that creates the, the magnetic field and the magnetic field protects the, the Earth. But when those particles hit at the high velocity that they're hitting, it actually compresses the magnetic field, and then that sends a charge that will go through electrical lines. And okay. so you will you know, have huge, huge uh, surges. surges of power that will go through. And, and overloads so, the grid potentially. And it overloads the grid. So the, the last really big event, the ones that we worry about, mm -hmm. uh, is called the Carrington event, which was a major solar flare in, I think it was 1859 is uh, when it hit. Uh, and at that time, uh, the only thing we really had were telegraph uh, cables, and the telegraph all went down in or most parts of, uh, of America. Uh, some telegraph offices actually burst into flames just because wow. of the, 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 the intensity of the particles. Uh, there are stories of when it hit, 
that uh, people out west here in the western part of the country uh, thought it was daylight even though it was in the middle of the night but they thought wow. it was daybreak and they got up and started making eggs and cooking and it was like, how long did that last uh, for, for, for quite a few hours wow. apparently so wow. it, so uh, but it but it didn't hit the telegraph but think of where we are today the telegraph is not our is not what we have today. We still have. I argue those. that's a better or worse thing, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, so now we have these massive power grids, and so uh, you can imagine the power surge that would go through the electrical system. Uh, we have capacitors, very large capacitors that that move the, the electrons all around, and if you get a surge and you blow out those those uh, those transformers, uh, the um, uh, it can uh, you can have a blackout and it could take a while to, to repair it. So in fact, some of these major transformers and there there's not that many of them, and it takes a long time to build them. Uh, that if one go if, if several of them go out, it's not like we have a big su sp uh, spare supply of these. Right. That you could see a power outage that could last for months. I see. And so folks worry about places like well, for example, it could happen here in, in uh, Eugene, but just think of New York City, Major city yeah. for no power for six months. Uh, they had it for a short period of time in the past. And, right. Right. The best way to try and prevent something like this from happening really rather comes down to the importance of being able to track these storms with enough time to give warning. Because uh, from my understanding, it would be much easier for us to protect ourselves against something like that by being able to turn off that power grid in the first place rather than wait for something like that to happen to either rely on a backup system or spend trillions of dollars on repair. Um, so what would you, how, how far have we come in being able to track these storms now to maybe possibly create a, a type of early warning system like we do with tornadoes or hurricanes or something like that? Well, we do. Uh, and, and you mentioned the cost, uh, the, that Carrington event that I mentioned from 1859, uh, the Lloyds of London has estimated that if we, we had an event like that uh, today, it would be well in excess of a trillion dollars of uh, damage. So that's uh, real money. And just the time that it would take to repair could be... Long time. Yeah, more, which would be part of that. Which would be uh, right. the disruptions to it would be, you know, would be sig significant. And so to protect it, you can you can build in protections in the system with capacitors and other kinds of uh, ways. That's very expensive uh, to do. Another another thing you can do, as you mentioned, is you could just shut down the grid because then uh, you're not going to see the the charges. You'll, there won't be electricity going through the the grid, which will which will uh, protect the, the system. But but shutting down a grid, especially if it's... Yeah, how uh, easy is that decision? That's, that's not an easy decision, and uh, and, there are con and there's costs just to shutting down the grid. There's consequences for that. Right. So it's you, never had to happen before, which would also probably make it more difficult. Absolutely. The absolutely. first time. But, it, but part of that uh, is if we're going to do that, and we have to get those protocols, and that's legislation, actually, that I've been working on that we'll hopefully get passed. Uh, if we're going to get there, you have to have the early warning system. So you, you need to have the satellites that are out there uh, that are watching the sun constantly. And, and when you see a major flare, it can warn us and then they can do the calculations, will it actually hit the earth or not? And uh, at what time? And they do, I mean, we had we had a major flare uh, that um, uh, was a Carrington type event if it hit the earth. And I believe it was in 2012. Hmm. Uh, then we missed it by just a few days. Wow. So, so it does happen. So. No one thinks this is a question of if, this is a question of uh, when. Uh, and the reason I was really pulled into this issue, one, it's like because I'm on the committee that deals with space, right. uh, but also the University of Michigan uh, is probably one of the, some of the leading heliophysicists uh, in the country, and they came to me early in my tenure in the Senate. They said, Senator, we think you really need to be aware of this potential risk we right. face, and I hope that you would focus on this uh, as part of your work uh, with NASA. Right. I mean, the uh, solar flares is something that doesn't get as much press, but it's a constant threat all the time. They're being emitted uh, randomly all throughout the sun in every direction. And it's just a matter of synchronicity to see if we're really going to have a problem. Uh, so it sounds like at least uh, you're on, on the ball and uh, you're looking out for everybody. And at least the progress that's being made uh, should help to event these kinds of events in the future. So, okay, now I'm going to have to ask you a few questions that may start to border on the edge of conspiracy. Otherwise, I'll never hear the end of it from not only our listeners, but just my own peers, um, if that's okay. So prior to taking office, uh, what, if any, have been some of the conspiracies throughout your lifetime that have piqued your interest? And have you been able to learn anything to quench those curiosities since you took office? Well, I don't know. I, have, I, I, try, I try to uh, uh, not dwell on conspiracy oh. theories. Right, I guess facts would be a better realm. <laughs> I try to exactly. Um, okay, so why don't we why don't we start a little bit uh, getting back to space debris for a moment? 
So there have been supposed whistleblowers uh, that tell of a vast junkyard of alien technology littering our solar system, uh, so much so that it would be impossible f to explore in one human lifetime, and that there's possibly even debris of forgotten technologies from an ancient past that's been hidden from us where humans possibly thrived in a spacefaring age. So to your knowledge, has any of the technological debris floating around up there been traced to extraterrestrial or even ancient Earth origins? I, I've, not had, I've not seen any evidence of that uh, whatsoever. Okay. But, uh, but we will be tracking all, trying to find what all the space debris is up there. So, uh, so there's, a, there's a lot unknown, I will say that. We talked a little bit about NASA's ability and their plans to land on an asteroid uh, to study the, the makeup of that. Have they uh, done it? Uh, using that technology, is it possible to continue to study any of the other debris that are floating around up there? Well, you could. You could have rendezvous. I mean, we're going to have uh, satellites that will we'll rendezvous with, with uh, debris and try to, to want to control it and, and and move it or destroy it, whatever it has to be do to clean it up. So, so certainly that uh, that technology exists. Uh, but you're right. I mean, we in fact that that was the uh, launch that I was able to see, which was Osiris uh, Rex, which is a scientific mission to the the asteroid Bennu, which mm -hmm. uh, is a asteroid that visits us uh, regularly. Uh, we expect it uh, to be here in the next uh, couple decades, I believe. Uh, and we think it, we, we're pretty confident it's going to miss uh, the Earth, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, but, uh, it's more of a uh, research project than a save humanity project. It is not a yes. Okay. It's not a save the humanity project, but it's related to should we have it because there is. And we're tracking uh, asteroids and large uh, uh, objects uh, that are in there, and uh, most of the really big objects we we believe we know where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we, we we hope that we know where all the extinction type objects are, but we have to constantly be scanning you know, the. The, uh, the solar system, and we actually have a planetary protection uh, division within NASA that does that kind of thing to, to do it. But when you have smaller objects, there's just so many, and there are estimates of how many, how much percentage we know, but no one can say that. But right, right. I always push back on the scientists, how yeah, do you really know anything for to, fact, to, right. to do that? Uh, so, uh, so, so having a technology to be able to do that could be helpful. A smaller object could still wipe out a, a region of the world, which would be catastrophic, clearly. So uh, the the, uh, the Osiris Rex will rendezvous with the satellite. It will try. It'll actually orbit the uh, asteroid for a period of time because it wants to study. You have your mathematical projections of how the asteroid moves, but how do how does as it gets closer to the sun and it gets the particles and other things that are happening in space? Does that actually how does that actually change the trajectory of an asteroid? So it will be able to allow us to to calculate more precisely where it actually is, where exactly it's going to go. But probably the most exciting part of that say mission, okay. the most exciting part of the mission in my mind, is that we believe, or scientists I should say, believe that, uh, that the Earth, the, the life that we see on Earth here may have been seeded uh, by asteroids bringing some of the basic building blocks, so basic uh, carbons and, and uh, things that, that allowed life to eventually emerge uh, here. Uh, on the planet, and folks think that Bennu may have been that type of asteroid that could have had the building blocks in it that seeded Earth, uh, seeded Earth life on Earth. And so, before, uh, after it does the study, it's going to drop a, a bucket. It's okay. a more sophisticated name for that, <laughs> right, 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 right. Right. but uh, it'll drop a bucket uh, down and sample collector, sample collector, yes, mm -hmm. and uh, grab uh, some of the asteroid and uh, bring it back to Earth. And then we can study it to see if indeed uh, it has some of the building blocks of organic life uh, here in uh, in the Earth. That would be uh, that would be a pretty amazing discovery. That would be amazing to help to just get an understanding of how we all came to be here, right? Uh, and possibly what else is out there for us. Absolutely. Okay, so our next question uh, it has to do with faster than light travel. So some have said that since absorbing German scientists after World War II into our military and private sectors through, I think it was Operation Paperclip, we quickly became capable of traversing the stars with more advanced technologies, far superior than what NASA has disclosed to the public. Ben Rich, the director of Lockheed Skunk Works, he actually had been quoted as saying in 2019, we already have the means to travel among the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black projects, and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity. Anything you can imagine, we already know how to do, unquote. He also was quoted as saying, quote, we now have the technology to take ET home. No, it won't take someone's lifetime to do it. There's an error in the equations. We know what it is. We now have the capability to travel the stars, unquote. So, Senator, to your knowledge, what is the most advanced technology that NASA commands when it comes to traveling in space? 
Well, I, I have not seen anything to to uh, verify uh, uh, what uh, the, the quotes that you read there about uh, them being able to move faster than the speed of light. I have not seen anything related to that at all. As for what you have seen, what is the fastest capable travel that we do? Uh, it, it's uh, it's uh, it's well below layer, so it did it, it take it would take a long time even to get to the closest star system that we have uh, next to us. So, so, so we're still just using rockets. Still using well rockets, or uh, while well, they get in there, and then you have different kind of propulsion systems that allow you to to achieve pretty high speeds. But mm. but the vastness of space means it would take centuries uh, to get to a lot of places. Is that, it? would you say, a consistent effort by scientists to continue to crack that, um, the speed of light travel? Oh, Is I think, still yeah, there are the yeah, there's certainly folks that continue to think about that, but mm. I'm, I'm not aware of, of any Many of the breakthroughs yet? I'm not aware of any of the capabilities that have been outlined here. Okay. It would be really great, uh, and uh, but I'm not aware of that. Okay, we'll move on to another fun one. Uh, this next question has to do with uh, Planet 12, or Nibiru, some people call it, that was made famous by the book The Twelfth Planet by researcher and archaeologist Zachariah Sitchin. Uh, and this was about a planet that exists in a 3,600-year orbit around our sun that upon returning to near-Earth orbit would have adverse effects on our planet, not only physically, but possibly by a race of advanced beings who inhabit it. Have you ever learned of the possibility of another planet yet to be disclosed to the public that may be taking its sweet time making its back to us, possibly with harmful effects to the planet? No, I, I haven't been. I haven't been briefed on that. Nothing That's there not, either. Nothing okay. there either. No. Okay, so now we go on to this last one, just to ask, and this one has to do kind of with the moon, but we're not going to get into any of the moon landings. But to your knowledge, uh, do you have any reason to believe that any of the NASA missions? moon or otherwise, have resulted in the knowledge that intelligent life outside of our own planet exists out there? No, I'm not aware. Not of, uh, no. And folks, keep uh, keep looking. Still but, looking? Uh, still looking. But no smoking gun yet? Not yet. Okay. All right. Well, I'll stop there before I feel too threatened by any answers you might give me. So, Senator, I really can't thank you enough for making time to speak with me today. Uh, it really has been a pleasure. It's great to be with you here, Michael. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for showing me around uh, Space Buds. This is really great. Oh, this has been amazing for all of us here, not only for the cannabis enthusiasts, but just to talk about all the unknown, unexplored that are still out there for us to learn about. Thank you so much for being here and shining a light a little bit on sort of what we can come to expect, possibly for our cannabis future and for our future of space exploration. All right. This has been a Space Buzz, the podcast special guest edition with United States Senator Gary Peters. Join us again next time for your dose of cannabis and conspiracy that only Space Buzz, the podcast, can provide. Thank you for listening.